Hi everyone, welcome here to the uh, Eindhoven Innovation Cafe, lovely to you all. see you here. For those who haven't been here before, we are a weekly networking event where we offer presentations on subjects of design and or technology. Tonight we have Daniel Antal here from uh, Reprex talking about how we can share big data collaborat collaboratively on uh, several levels. Um, after the presentation and Q&A, we have the opportunity to have some drinks, maybe a meal at the meetup table, but I'll uh, tell you a bit more about that later. But first, enjoy the presentation. Thank you very much, Anouk. So, good evening, hello. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm just waiting for uh, people to pass by. So, so hi, um, my name is Daniel. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Reprex. Uh, my other co-founder is in the United States uh, now. Um, I'm going to introduce a little bit um, what we have been doing with music and music data and then expand it to other topics. I will very briefly introduce our music work. Um, then show a little bit of a catalog what you can do with our data, and then I'll obviously try to leave as much time for questions and answers as possible. So, why? Um, okay. Um, where do I point? <laughs> Well, thanks. So, um, so music is one of the most data-driven industries in the world. Um, more than 60% of music is sold um, on the biggest data platforms of the biggest data companies of the world, like uh, Google's YouTube or Apple or Spotify. Um, it is mainly sold by autonomous systems, uh, which means data-driven algorithms that are trying to match the music to the audiences. Um, that means that if everything goes well, your music finds its audience. If there is a glitch with your data, then it can have a really, really bad consequence on you. Um, one of the negative events that can happen is that you end up on Forgetify, which is um, an application that plays songs which have never been played on Spotify ever. Um, not even their mothers, brothers, sisters. There are millions of songs like that. And um, we started to figure out how you end up on Forgetify um, when we try to figure out why we often see that Slovak music is not recommended for Slovak people in Slovakia. And of course, there are a lot of data problems. So if a music or a musician is not well described by data for these machines that are learning from the data, then it cannot figure out what to do with it. The other thing that can, can, ro can go wrong is that the money is not finding you, which is even worse. In Slovakia, we check the 600 most streamed songs with the rights holder organizations there. And we found when we did the feasibility study of the project I'm going to show, that about half of uh, the artists didn't receive all their payments. So suppose that you find out that something is not really going well with your music, then you probably start to claim this money or try to figure out what went wrong. And at that point, you will get into a discussion with the data engineers and data scientists of the biggest data companies. And if you are a music label or a music producer or work for a boom and stem like organization, even which is not a small organization, you will find out that you don't have a data engineer, you don't have a data scientist. And there is an army of very well paid people who will tell you why you are wrong. So, we're trying to help with these, um, these problems. In the United States, there is a partial prob uh, solution for this, which in the first one and a half years of its existence have found 
424 million dollars that were not paid to individuals um, in these data glitches. Um, we're talking about about 100 or 200 years of income of a small country, all musicians. In Europe, nothing similar to this exists, but we're trying to build something that resembles this and goes beyond. Um, so this is our project. Um, it's called the Digital Music Observatory. In the last almost 10 years, I persuaded one by one more and more music organizations that in this era of big data and AI, they have to pull together, they have to share data, they have to share these resources to work with data because big data creates really big inequalities. So only the biggest corporations like Google or the richest governments, like the US government can sustain really, really big data collection programs. And the answer to this, in Europe there are about 100,000 small enterprises and individuals who work with music, is that you do something collaboratively. So um, we put together more and more organizations, more and more individuals. We have individuals who are working for us who have a data problem, organizations into a, a consortium that is going to build a prototype for the European Music Observatory. Generally, the UN and the European Union suggest for these large data problems to pull together in a PPP, a public-private partnerships of researchers, business interests. Um, there are about 60 so-called observatories, places that collect data for um, a more or less single goal. Um, we're building one for European music. Um, but we're not really a music tech company. So this was our first project, but we realized that the problem of these music organizations is that they don't have a data engineer or a data scientist. They cannot afford one. And those data engineers who work in the Silicon Valley, well, probably their annual gross salary is more than that of a civil society organization that deals with music. But this is not a music-related problem. This is the inequality that is created by big data. So in Europe, there are about 20 million small businesses that do not have a specialized data team. And um, also, there are a lot of people who don't know what algorithms are doing with them. One of the examples I will talk about, just a few words, we're trying to figure out how algorithms are interacting with us and our children. And there's not really a way how you can do it other than pooling resources together. So we started to build, similarly to the music observatory, um, other data ecosystems. We're building one for general culture and creative sectors and industries. Um, we're doing something for so-called ent uh, computational antitrust. A lot of our music cases end up being uh, competition law cases, fighting data monopolies, for example or fighting large organizations that are not paying musicians. And we think that our approach could apply to other sectors that are fragmented, where there are a lot of small companies. Um, and we're building two sustainability-related data observatories. Um, one is green, one is the social aspect of environmental and social uh, governance reporting data. Um, we are offering free open data, usually free open source tools. Um, those open source software tools that we're using for these purposes have a very fast growing uh, user base. About 60,000 people downloaded them, but still, these are really geek products. You have to know how to code. So our next uh, aim is to make our project and what we're doing more accessible for a general, more general usership. Um, we're also um, in the finals of this competition. Um, we're competing with seven companies in The Hague for um, The Hague uh, Innovation Award, which is, I think, the biggest such competition in the country for um, startups that are working on sustainable development goals. 
And so that's Reprex, that's what we are doing with the observatories. And for the Q&A, I just want to drop a few topics that might be interesting for you. It's more of a catalog. So one of the things that we're doing is that we're trying to make open data accessible. So open data is, is a big word. It usually means that there is a data somewhere on a public institution server that you can legally access, but maybe it is in a 1998 SPSS form without documentation, or maybe it's full of rubbish. So open data, access to open data is a right, but it's not a service and we're investing into tools that instead of um, panning out these little gems of uh, gold from the muddy um, waters of these institutions, try to automate how you can get out open data from these government or public silos. Um, so usually open data looks like really just a pile of information and not something that you can search. Um, a very interesting use case of this is that we're getting into the archives of survey research, like what questionnaires people have been answering since the 70s or even going back to the 50s. Here we looked for the same questions and answers in a lot of uh, Arabic countries. Um, here we asked musicians the same questions that has been asked from about um, 100,000 Europeans in other surveys. Um, here we compared how people in different years and countries were thinking about climate change. So we want to make this right for open data actually more practical. Then the second thing we want to do where we think that there's a lot of data needed is making AI work for all. That is um, the motto of the Dutch AI coalition to make uh, AI work for all. I think that AI requires a lot of data and to figure out what goes wrong in AI um, is something um, that doesn't work if you don't have a large data infrastructure behind you and we want to share this infrastructure with everybody. We want to connect um, data. Um, this is one of our experimental projects when we're connecting information about um, Jewish music um, artists who play Jewish music um, in different global libraries, research centers, and of course on Spotify and YouTube and everywhere, so that basically instead of searching for text about music, you can actually find the piece that you're interested in, you can find um, the music notations of that music or the recording of that music. And of course, we think that what we're doing really fits into the sustainability agenda. Um, our users work on many sustainability aspects, mainly um, gender equality, decent work for decent pay, um, also education, climate change, climate adaptation. Um, but what we can really add here is to make the access to public information more tangible for them. Um, so we're helping basically on this meta level of sustainability goals and in terms of partnership, whatever we do, um, everything is open source, open data, and we want to facilitate the use um, also in the least developed countries. Um, we're going to start education programs on how to use our services so they are not confined to be used in a rich country like ours. So basically, these are just topics what we do, um, and I'm really open for your questions. Please. Yes, so um, what's your business model for this? How do you get this? This will cost money and spend it. How do you spend it? How do you sustain this for a long time? Yes, that's a very good question. So we have three income streams. Um, well, the maintenance of, so data observatories are usually United Nations or EU recognized institutions. We want to be their data provider. There are about 60 such organizations in the world. 
about three new are coming up every year. Um, so we want to be the data provider of such institutions, and we also want to encourage Dutch cities, including, of course, The Hague, to be the seats of this, because this way a city will become the global knowledge center of something. So that's one thing, that's standard data work. Um, the second income stream is that these data observatories are usually public-private partnerships. So obviously music is our most developed use case, where we work with a lot of um, music organizations, researchers, and we do research automation for them, and they are paying for it. So usually we offer that, well, whatever you pay um, for data acquisition, we can get you a lot more for that money, because we can tap into open data sources, but also we can give you the data in a much better form. We can um, even put it directly into the manuscripts of books or journals. And the third income model, uh, which we really want to focus on now, is that we already, through our partnerships, um, found a lot of uses that do not only interest those larger institutions that are in our observatory uh, ecosystem, but have a wide user base and we are building applications that use this data. So we have three application families. One is called Listen Local, which helps um, small music players to be relevant on global music platforms or help local radios. And this is rolled out by national music organizations. So we're not going to work with very small organizations directly, but like Buma Stemra-like organizations. Um, we are also developing a very similar with the big four, one of the big four companies. We want to create a module that puts um, sustainability information into their sustainability reporting tools. So, and the third one is uh, basically um, making reporting, uh, a reporting tool that connects directly to these open databases and puts the right information into the reports and they can only focus on the rest. So that's the three income streams. But this makes it possible that basically our data and our software will remain always free. So you only pay for the convenience. Please. You said you are looking for partners. What is the idea of partners for you? What are you looking for? Um, I tried to go back uh, to the music slides because there maybe it's a bit visible. Yep, not so much. So basically when we start to build a, an observatory, we're looking for some data users who are frustrated that they don't find data. These are either NGOs or researchers, it's just a single person. So we're asking people to be our data curator, tell us what is the data that you don't find and how do you want it to look like? And we will try to bring it up to you. And if you like, if you don't like it, tell us how we can improve. So we're looking for data curators who are usually knowledgeable people in the world of art or in the world of research, and they have a data problem. That's one thing. Then we are looking for institutions that share the similar problems. So in music, obviously, we know already a lot of, lot of organizations, more than 60 uh, participated in one of our joint research projects. Um, and eventually, if there's something similar to what I explained, that we think that there's a greater need for creating an application, then we're looking for a business partner who would be distributing it, because I don't think that we want to be that company. So, depending on the topic, well, we have a very major ecosystem in music, so there are the, the partnerships that we're looking for are really large umbrella organizations of music now. But in uh, the developing topics, it can be an individual who just has an interesting data angle. Well, um, it's not music related, but we now really focusing on our green observatory, and I can tell you it's also on our website, um, two very, very specific use cases. Um, 
I'll tell, tell, tell both of them because they are very nice and very small. One of them is a startup that is making intelligent beehives. So it's putting sensors into beehives. You know that there is a huge problem in Europe and there are everywhere in the world that honeybees are dying and uh, there are not enough pollinators. There have been a lot of research why this is happening. There's not a really, really good answer for that. There have been research to putting sensors into the hives, but there's a lot of problem with this. Um, so they have intelligent beehives that have sensors in, and we are giving them the rest of the data. So meteorological or satellite data um, about the environmental conditions of the beehives so that they can correlate this information, what goes wrong with the bees, why bees are dying. That's one very, very specific case. The other one, it's also a green case. We have an inventor um, who's making a very special heat exchanger um, that can take out the heat content of wastewater. So when you are using the shower or washing your dishes, you usually um, emit dirty water that is maybe 20, 25 degrees warm that goes into the sewage system. And if it's like minus five in the winter, then there's a huge heat difference and you could use that heat. But commercial heat pumps don't really work in the sludge in the waste system. So he designed a, a special kind of heat pump that can work in the, in, in the sludge and the wastewater of sewage. Um, but to make this work, we need a power, a district heating station or a large hospital building or something that wants to use that heat because transporting heat is, is very costly. So we're making a special search for certain types of sewage pipelines which are in the vicinity of hospitals or district heating buildings all over in Europe. So for that, we have to access the um, building cadasters of cities, the pipeline information, but we also need to know how many heating days there are in that city, etc. So that this way we can have a small startup that wouldn't be able to finance a pan-European market research to find these locations can easily figure out where it could place this heat pump. So I think uh, these examples are endless, but of course we are working in ecosystems, so we can only help them if they are related to something that we're already doing. So if somebody's coming with something that is not connected to our observatories, then well, we can probably give good advice who's doing similar things, but this is what we do. Please. Can you give us a feeling how long it takes to set up such an observatory, for instance, for the beehives? Well, the beehives will be a part of a much larger observatory. So that's the point that the entire bee business and the entire honey production of the world wouldn't really justify to set up such an infrastructure. So we want to put it together with a lot of other environmental uses. Um, I think um, in the case with the music, I ended up having this what I have in eight or 10 years, but that's because I didn't know where I'm going. I was basically a music economist to figure it out there is a problem. So very actively, I started Reprex in 2020. Um, um, I did the product market fit in the YesDev incubator two years ago. I think the first observatory will be a really big operational thing in five years. The second one will probably last four years and the next one will three years. And you um, provide That's up to them. We are, uh, we are providing uh, data and data processing software and data processing infrastructure. So in AI, people say um, usually that 90% of the job is data processing and 10% is testing algorithms. We do the data processing part. How about the liability? Provide data and something wrong with well, that's why I think our business model is really good, um, because we work with open source software, open algorithms, open data, so everything is transparent in our case, from source 
until the final use, everything goes through peer review and everything is transparent. Um, or, or software, so we're not a software company. It's, it's available with a GPL license. Um, so it's actually everybody's responsibility to use it responsibly. But um, we think that the transparency aspect increases the chances that the data is going to be right. Did you? Uh, you named a number of 20 million companies that don't have data analysts. And um, I know companies that do have data analysts and that they uh, stuff their machine with all kinds of sensors to get the data, not knowing what to do with it, and that they thought the application will come by itself. So, so your question is um, about data analysts, and my number was not really about data analysts, but data engineers and data scientists. So usually I think the problem is that a lot of people, and I, I don't say that there are 20 million companies that don't have an analyst. A lot of companies have an analyst. They just don't have the know-how how to bring in the correct data in a valid format into their organization at scale. That's more of an engineering and data scientist task. That is usually missing. And then usually two things happen. They start to build databases, and I think the database as a concept is only working for very large organizations that have hundreds of thousands of repeated transactions. Like Amazon is selling millions of books, a database serves them very well. But if you're a small organization, usually you have a database and already two months later you realize that you have different questions and the database is not able to answer you that question. So our solution to this is to get rid of the database and uh, get into a different data model, linked open data. But working with linked open data requires programming, computer science, data engineering, work. that's what they don't have. So actually, we want to serve those who have an analyst, but they don't really have the engineering know-how to get large amount of information into their systems. Is, is this an answer to your question? Well, uh, then I, I didn't say correctly. The company I was talking about, the example, they have data engineers, still they don't find any add value to it. I see. Is there something that you then think that they are missing? Is there always something you can get out of it? Or why should companies have a data engineer? Well, so your question is, is what to do with a company that has data engineers, but they are not doing uh, valuable work for them? Well, they don't get value out of it. Well, but that's a really luxury problem to have because the data engineer is very, very expensive. So to have data engineers who don't contribute to value is, I don't think this is a problem that is lasting long because who's going to pay for that? I have no answer to this question. I think this is a luxury to have for very, very few companies. I mean, I lost one of my team members to such an organization. He was a data engineer. He was offered the job for 200K that's in super gross terms, always half a million a year. Um, most organizations I work with, that's their annual budget. So, so you're saying they're missing, but when you have them, there are examples as well that those engineers don't produce value. How do you know when they produce value? So if you say, I don't have one, but should I have one? Well, I mean, in the case of, of music, um, so we started to work um, with the Slovak Rights Holders Associations, and uh, we know that we created value because since we started working, their members, we're talking about 3,000 artists in Slovakia, receive 20 to 30 percent more money. So then we know that we have a value. I mean, I'm trying to serve end users. Um, but that is pretty clear. Yes. When I have another business making bread or something like that, how do I know that I... Can, can you uh, serve that party as well, that organization, if 
it would be valuable for them? Well, I mean, if I can uh, serve somebody who's building beehives, I think that probably I can serve a baker too. But usually, well, we're, we're a data science company. So actually, I think we can work with somebody who already has a question. I don't find the information for this. I want to know how the price of uh, the ingredients for my bakery products is fluctuating all over Europe. Where should I place my, I don't know, my logistics? But I cannot figure out for them. I don't know anything about bakery. I know about data. So, for example, I know about certain open data um, sources that are not well known, that contain the price of ingredients all over in Europe systematically collected. I'm talking about the inflation data that is collected by statistical offices as open data I can go not to the inflation data, but all the data that was collected to calculate the inflation, for example, flour that is used by bakers. So if they need that information, I can give them. But, um, but we're not really uh, consultants who help you to turn around your bakery. <clears throat> So if we do collaboration with Spotify, that's a very interesting question. Because first of all, we almost only work with companies that have a really big problem with Spotify. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, in a way, yes. Um, I'm the maintainer of Spotify R, which is the, for the R open source statistical community, the open source API towards Spotify's um, um, databases including their Econess database, which I think is a super valuable tool. Um, so we don't want to be antagonistic to these big companies, and I really believe that working with them is very useful. We don't have any direct relationship with them. So Spotify R is actually not endorsed by Spotify, but I inherited this open source project from one of their engineers. Um, so. No, we are not working directly with Spotify. We're working with a lot of people who currently have a problem with how Spotify works. Um, but we just try to be the data providers who can create um, a discussion. So in this slide, what you see here is in 20 countries, the reference price for streaming. So how much an artist received for a single play of their songs. Um, on Spotify, these are Apple Music and YouTube. We aggregated them, so we didn't want to pinpoint out Spotify. The general uh, perception of people was that streaming income is increasing in Europe, and we showed that in 20 countries, out of the 20 countries, we found only one where it is actually increasing. It is decreasing. So my answer is, unfortunately, we don't. I would like to. How about SoundCloud? We don't. All right. Great. I think just to round things off, thank you so much for your presentation and for answering all of our questions. Thank you very much I for having me. suggest we uh, carry on talking at the bar. We, uh, you can get some drinks and we'll provide a few snacks. Uh, if you've taken any drinks or glasses with you here, please uh, take them back with you into the restaurant. Um, it's also possible to stay at the meetup table, which is a meal that we offer all of the um, Innovation Cafe participants uh, for 19 euro 50. Today it's a spaghetteria with uh, pomodoro and mozzarella. And um, next week we have Leon Kuppen here uh, from UXI, who will be talking about the project Rethinking Plastic. Uh, but check out the uh, website. For, of Innovation Cafe to check out the further program because we're here every week. Also, thank you to everyone who is watching online. I uh, wish you a lovely evening and we'll uh, see you at the bar. Thank you. Thank you.
Hey, you're still here. So you like the video. If you want, subscribe and click the bell.